the Oregon spaces turned into a real thing and it may change the landscape of how things are done in college football. Uh, Cam Newton, man, I was rooting for Cam. I was rooting for Cam, but it's over, man. It's over and it sucks. Bill's Mafia, the saddest fan base in the NFL right now. The Heisman Trophy, um, got it wrong. Got the winner right, but got the finalist wrong. Um, a special topic, and of course, Urban Meyer is in the news again. So guess what? You know it ain't good. And ten Chicago Bulls are now in the COVID protocols. What the hell? Where the? How did this happen? I'm George Reister. He's Ralph Amson, and this is Reister or Wrong, the intersection where sports, business, society, and pop culture meet the truth. Absolute fire on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Facts only. Make sure you check your feelings at the door because no BS is allowed. We keep it 100. So, Ralph, uh, oh, you guys, make sure that you leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts. Swipe up, thumbs up if you're watching it on YouTube. Tell a friend. Sharing is the most important thing. Let's keep this thing growing. The biggest podcast in the nation. Um, so, uh, oh, so I guess we'll start with the uh, Cam Newton thing. So, you are a Carolina Panthers, I guess, adjunct fan, <laughs> like peripheral fan now that you live in the city, even though we know that you're all Arizona all the time. But... But you, to be fair, to be fair, when they came out, what was it, 96? When they came out with the with the Panthers logo and those jerseys and those team colors, I was 12. And I was like, a blue team with a Panther on it. Tim Biaka Matuka. Ray Carruth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At the time, Ray Carruth. Um, Kerry Collins. They, yeah, I, I, I thought they were great. At the time. So I've, I, and that's the thing about all Charlotte sports is like they're not offensive to anybody. Nobody hates Charlotte anything. Um, they're just nice. And so I, I could see myself. I've been to a few games. It's a great experience. Fans are cool. And, and, and I think I've, I think I, like anybody else, have always rooted for Cam Newton, regardless. Dude, and me, while Cam has been on this comeback tour, I have been all in, bro, because. There is no shortage of hard work. There is no, like, his body is ready, his mind, he's changed his mentality. It's about the team. All of these things. Like, he's, like, if Cam Newton knew what Cam Newton knows now, 10 years ago, bro, do you know how dangerous this dude would be as a football player? But now he's dealing with, like, his shoulder does not have it. And there was an NFL player that worked out with him about three years ago. Um, and he was like, yo, but I didn't find this out until recently. And this is a star wide receiver who worked out with Cam. And he was like, bro, that shoulder's cooked, dude. He was like, there's nothing left in it. He was like, he can't make the throws. He can't be consistent because his shoulder is jacked up. So it's not that Cam doesn't have the knowledge that he doesn't have the desire the work ethic, do you see his body, the studying, any of that? Like, every single box is checked except for the physical check right now. It's done. And for me, it's sad to see. But also, it's one of those things where I'm like, ah, father time is undefeated, dude. It's kicking Cam's ass right now. Yeah. it, And, I mean... There, there's always going to be Cam Newton defenders. I've been one. I feel like maybe you've been one. But like, okay, Cam Newton isn't in. Maybe he's not in game shape yet. He had seven. He has seven touchdowns total, four rushing, three passing in the last four weeks. You know what else could you expect of him? Um, well, they're paying him starter money. You have to judge him like a starter. Your boy Gerald Alexander and the Miami Dolphins put him in absolute hell last week. They're 0-3 going with him as the starter. He's turned the ball over four times in the last three weeks. They beat the Cardinals, but, like, 
he wasn't throwing the ball in that game. He wasn't ready in that game. He was running the ball, screaming, I'm back, and everything like that. And if he's saying I'm back, I think what he means is the Patriots version of him is back. Because I don't, I don't, it's hard for me to envision Cam Newton going out there and throwing for 200 yards, much less 300. He's doing a good job of getting the ball out and making sure he doesn't get sacked. He, he's throwing interceptions, but I think that just has to do with, it's kind of easy to read what he's doing and where he's going with it. I don't, it, this is one of those situations where it's just kind of, it, he's not going out completely sad. He's not completely ineffective. Yeah, for sure. Um, but he's not the answer for a team that is throwing everything at the wall to see if they can just manufacture a win. I've never seen a team do this much to try to get out of a hole before. Whether no, it's they firing are. Joe Brady, who everybody loves, I'm like, bringing in uh, Cam Newton, going back to P.J. Walker, who played for Matt Rule at Temple. Like Dude, he's how, just trying to find somebody who's familiar with this system. How much did the did the the Joe Brady firing feel like? What? What? You you he doesn't have the quarterback that he thought that he was going to have. He's makeshift quarterbacking uh, yeah. because uh, be, because Sam Darnold fell apart and then got injured, and then. He hasn't had Christian McCaffrey for two seasons, basically. Like the 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 wide receiver crew's been they've switched guys out. Like what what do you expect a an offensive coordinator to do? And last year's quarterback was was Teddy Bridgewater. This year it was Sam Darnold. How can you be successful like that? And that's just the thing is you uh, how many how many NFL fans get frustrated that their coordinator or their head coach is three weeks late on making a move on trying a different quarterback on switching up the offense. That's not Matt rule. He's doing everything he possibly can think of to, to it's like, it's like a recipe is turning out bad and he's just hand sprinkling in different ingredients Even to so, try to get the taste yes. right before it comes out of the oven. And now it's come to a point where he's over-tinkering. He's probably over-tinkering at this point. Like to right. where he and, wants and, to make I, it work so bad that now it's like, mm, I don't know. Yeah, but at the same time, like I, I like I like that. I like that more than I like, oh my gosh, th- we keep making the same mistake over and over and over and over again. We're not benching a quarterback that it just isn't okay. Isn't feeling so it right how now. do you want to see Cam to Newton? Seat. So does Cam Newton need to be, is it time to not start him? Is it time to move on and just let PJ Walker start? I personally feel like if you've got two quarterbacks, you don't have a quarterback is, is an, a near universal truth. But yes. what if you have one and what if you have one and a half quarterbacks? Because there's stuff Cam Newton can do that PJ Walker can't. There's stuff Cam Newton can do that you can't stop. There's a lot that Cam Newton is doing that you can stop. But if you line him up in a third and one with the option to like either jump over the pile or fake handoff, roll out, dump into the flat if there's a really specific Cam Newton package that keeps a defense on its heels and he produces in it, like he did against the Arizona Cardinals, I say you use it because to me, that's not having two quarterbacks. That's not, it's not, it's you, you have, uh, you have short yardage uh, package, just like you have a goal line set where you bring in like an extra tackle or something like that. He gives you an advantage that nobody else has in really specific instances but as far as if Matt, because I think Matt Rule came out this week and said, I'm still going to play them both. Then if you're going to be in a situation where you got to move the ball down the field, then maybe, maybe that's not, maybe that's not Cam. And I feel yeah. like Cam Newton is at a point in his career where he's going to give you his all when he's on the field and he's not going to turn down that $10 million paycheck. Oh, for sure. He's just going to be a good teammate. He he was. A, I thought he was a good teammate in New England last year, and I thought New England did right by him by freeing him up to not sit on the bench behind Mac Jones. But can you imagine if he had stayed in New England and they used him in that way to just have another short yardage weapon? I'm kind. I'm kind of upset for Cam Newton that he's not on this ride with New England right now. 
No, man, because it wouldn't have worked. Like you, you can't just bring Cam in to 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 use his body. That's not right to to him. It's not right in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Like that'd be dirty. Like I would not be. Okay so what do you think? That. So, so you you would you would, you would rather see him out there throwing interceptions than scoring touchdowns? No, I, I think you either have to play him or don't. I don't think that there's any in between with it. I think that you either play Cam Newton or you don't play Cam Cam Newton. All right. Um, okay, but if you're Carolina, just a yes or no, if you're Carolina Panthers head coach Matt Rule and it is third and goal from the one and P.J. Walker is your quarterback and Cam Newton's on the sideline, what are you doing? Running a play with P.J. Walker. I, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't right. do the wild cat weirdo stuff. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. I'm more of a traditionalist line up, run him, run it, run through his MF and face over and over and over again. All right. Um, now <laughs> this is funny because we saw the bills play Tampa Bay yesterday. Uh, Tampa Bay was whooping that ass. And then you had the bills make a heroic comeback tied the game up, sent it to overtime. But prior to that, I had been saying that if they lose this game to Tampa Bay, their season's over. They're not making the playoffs. They are going to fully fall apart because this team is clearly talented. But the fact that they're so young, they're led by Josh Allen, who's a young quarterback, that I knew that if they did not – that the fact that they were behind in the division right now, that it was just going to devastate them mentally because they were expected to win the division. And, they, and now they are not going to win the division. And now they may not make the playoffs. So looking at you, Bills fans, especially you, Mr. Ralph Amston, how sad are you? Because I think you're the saddest fan base in the NFL right now. I I I wasn't born into Bills fandom. Um I followed because of Josh Allen. I think it's a great fit with the people in the city. Um I really do think it's a marriage made in heaven. Last year uh Sean McDermott and 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 Brian Dable what they put together on offense was truly special. And you and I had a million conversations about, can they replicate it? Can they replicate it? And we have watched them struggle to run the ball, not even really attempt to run the ball. They got some distractions within the team uh, led by Cole Beasley, just being a weirdo. Um, but again, it, it, he's good enough and he fits within that offense enough that I guess you just kind of have to put up with it. Um, it's Josh Allen has put enough on film that that like he can't just he can't just out talent um, and out hustle. He has to be locked in at every single moment. And so I think I think this regression, you expected it. Um, I don't know if I did to this point. I think that they're a good team and there's a lot of adversity going on right now. But what I want to know is how in the living hell they didn't attempt to run the ball in the first half yesterday. Because that's not time, what they do. But zero? Have you ever seen anything like that? Not Wait, zero rush attempts? By a running back in the first half. Okay, not so one single touch. Not okay, one so which is, which is more outrageous? Playing a non-military school and only having your the team you're playing against attempt one pass in the first half? and be winning or not running the ball a week after that in the first half, which one is more outrageous? I, I feel like it's completely outrageous to not, to not attempt to not attempt to run the ball in an NFL game. I think that that's completely absurd. And I think that it's counter to the identity that the Buffalo bills need to, to succeed. They need to be able to bully you and have Josh Allen be that wild card. Because if you open up endless possibilities for Josh Allen, then that's when he's really going to be able to showcase who he is. And I, as upset as I am with the Buffalo Bills today, still have to point out 
that Josh Allen had a 300-100 game. Like, he had 308 yards passing, completed 67% of his passes, oh. and rushed for 109 yards and a touchdown. Oh, you sound like Kirk Cousins people right now. No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not being that. I'm not being that because... They're like, look at his stats. These- uh, I'm offended. <laughs> You've just offended me. No, I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying right now. However, the stats happened in the second half after they were down 24 to three and Josh Allen almost single-handedly forced overtime. Yes. Right. But before that happened at halftime, I found myself for the first time in my life tweeting some super weird fan shit. I said the Bills should trade Josh Allen. I was on a plane at the time watching the game. I said the Bills should trade Josh Allen. I said the Buffalo Bills should get relegated. And then I tweeted a picture of the uh, of uh, of your guy from Silk Sonic saying, "Not to be dramatic, but I want to die." <laughs> Dude, that's one of the best. That was lines. a rough. That that whole thing was a rough experience. I don't think you leave that game saying this is Josh Allen's fault. I don't. No, and I'm trying to be more objective about Josh Allen than I was being one of his only champions coming out of Wyoming because it's it, it was tough at the time when nobody would listen to you. I think it was like me and Matt Miller. Not that we're on any equal footing at all, but like <laughs> oh, shouting dude. from the rooftop. Yes, this guy you... was going to be legit. Yes, bro. Since 2016, bro. I and, and I was one of his staunchest. Uh, <laughs> opposers but i've come around like i think that josh allen is clearly a top 10 12 quarterback even even this year i think that he is that his floor i think i have a good idea i think this year feels flourish which is a very high floor well what would you do because because i feel like uh physical talent wise size him and him and Justin Herbert have a lot in common. I think yes, Justin Herbert freaks. has played. Yeah. And Justin Herbert has played high level, consistent, intelligent football for much longer than, than Josh Allen has even been allowed to attempt to do so. Um, what would you do if they came out and said, all right, Justin, you're the future of the NFL with your talent. We're just never going to run the ball again. It's all on you, buddy. No, like how would you feel about that? Yeah, and that so that's why I'm I was just very frustrated yesterday, and they didn't deserve to win. And so the one that hopefully there's some type of wake wake up call. And then the weirdest thing about that game is after not attempting a single run in the first half, they came out and handed the ball off a few times and ended up with uh with 64 yards rushing on seven carries. 64 yards on seven carries. So nobody thought the, so no, nobody was screaming in the microphone at prior to halftime. Be like, run the damn ball. And so, yeah, but, um, I was trying not to, I was trying not to cuss on an airplane, dude. (laughs) And you, you mentioned Justin Herbert, right? And I think this is a great segue because my question to you is this, sir. Have you, in your entire life, seen a better throw in the NFL than this. Herbert stops, launches deep. Jalen Guyton, he's got it. Touchdown, Chargers. What a throw. 63.8 yards in the air, bro. While he didn't get a chance to fully get his feet set, threw a dime into cover four where Guyton just ran past him. I, there are times I remember where uh, when we were in college, Joey Harrington, who was an NFL quarterback, top three pick, great quarterback, especially in college. I think he, his situation, I think he needed better pieces around him that he was one of those people in, in, in the league. Um, and I remember a guy we had on our team, Sammy Parker, who ran 10-1, right? Qualified for the Olympic trials. That Joey would uh, be like, all right, I got to get the ball out. I'm throwing it to Sammy because he can outrun your arm. You can't outrun Justin Herbert's arm. It's not possible because he can throw it the entire length of the football field, clearly. Like, imagine if he got his feet set. He could throw the ball 75 yards probably. Oh, man. 
That it is. It's the second best completion I've ever seen, and it's the third best throw. Because I'm one of those people that freaked out about that Pat Mahomes incompletion in the Super Bowl. Oh, my God. The one where he was diving on the gr- ground and yeah. then hit him in the yeah. hands. Yeah. 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 That's probably. Even, that's a, that's yeah, sick. If you if it, if completing the pass doesn't doesn't matter if it's just like the throw, because if that was like a net with a, you know, like the net with the hole in it. Oh, like it was going in the hole. Net, yeah. Yeah. So that was to me that like that. I've never seen anything like that before the best completion that I've ever seen. And it might just be because it was first was that Mike Vick to Deshaun Jackson. Oh my God. That was Eagles. stupid too. Bomb. He threw the ball like 75 yeah. yards in the air. And this is the first time where I was like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> like we, we got the real vanilla Vick. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Dude, his arm. But imagine big. being five inches taller and 30 pounds heavier. And, and it just being a flick of the wrist. With yeah. Herbert, with with Vic, that was like everything kind of worked out perfect, and he had Deshaun, and with with Justin Herbert, I'm like he could have come back the next play and done the exact same thing. Dude, he feels like, dude, he's Tim Duncan. That's who he is. Justin Herbert is Tim Duncan. He is a guy personality wise. Dude, he's vanilla ice cream. But guess what? It 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 always delivers. It is perfect for any type of pie. It's perfect. Like if you looked up. Oh, how to play quarterback in the the dictionary. What's the perfect way? Oh, play like Justin Herbert. Cool. Like he's a good leader. He works hard. He's humble. Like we're watching early Tom Brady like in terms of a guy who's focused on the game but also understands that he's not taking himself too too seriously. Bro, I love it. I love it. Inject that <laughs> It's interesting that you bring up Tom Brady because Um, not necessarily as like a comparison to like talent overall, but the one thing that they do have in common is the best football came after college. Yep. Bro, bro. And and do you, do you remember prior to the draft, the 2020 draft, who did I say should be the number one pick? But who is going to take you seriously? Exactly. Who's going to take you seriously? I got it. Who is going to take me seriously on Josh Allen? Yeah. You certainly but, didn't. No, I did not. Dude, it's, I got it, on TV, our radio, everything. They were like, oh, George, you're you're such a homer, bro. Tua, and I was like, I got questions about both of these dudes. But Bur- Burroughs turned out to be a really good quarterback. And Tua's not terrible. So, like. No, he, pre- he, he doesn't make mis- – he, he protects the football. He protects yeah. the football. He's it. What's weird is he feels like a continuation of Tannehill. They yeah. went through all that shit just to get Tannehill 2.0. Exactly. But if you had to redraft the last two classes, like 2019 yeah. and tw- 2019 with Kyler Murray even, I think that anybody chooses Justin Herbert first. And then they choose think Kyler so. second. How bad is that for Miami fans? Why does this keep happening to them? Even though they're in a decent place. They're in a decent place, but it feels like over and over and over again, if it comes down to them picking one quarterback or another. Remember, it was like tank for Tua, <laughs> and then they didn't tank. They they won, and then it actually made it the decision possible for them where they could have either drafted like they didn't because I thought that if you were drafting number one, there was so much pressure to take Joe Burrow number, number one, and you actually would not have lost. But when they were sitting at number five, they had the chance to take him. What would have been really interesting is because Justin Herbert returned for his senior year what would have been really interesting is if he did come out that year before and how that would have affected mm. his, his situation. Would you, okay. So, so who, who ahead, which of the five teams ahead of the chargers in the 2019 draft, do you think it or the 2020 NFL draft? Do you think is most regretful? Uh, Cause I think you can throw Cincinnati out. I think they have yeah. their guy. Yep. Um, hometown boy. Like, I think they're good. Chase Young. Chase Young Ooh. at number two. Do you think, do you think they would they, like that? They would, uh, cause he, he's had nine sacks so far. Yeah. 
Uh, Jeff Akuda would, de- I mean, definitely like they got to be in hell over that. Yeah. Oh God, yes. Um, for Detroit, and then the New York Giants took Andrew Thomas, the offensive tackle. They would like to have that back. <laughs> yeah, that's a that that that's a rough one. That's a rough one. But yeah. I, I I think that it worked out. It worked out, and he's he's kind of no frills, and so he's not going to be really distracted by L.A. And they had built up a lot of offensive weapons well, anyway. Well, and and Washington, though, as much as as good as Chase Young has been, they would rather have a quarterback right now. For sure. Yep. All right. Um, now, on to Oregon Spaces, dude. The Oregon Spaces – has turned into a crazy thing. So we're talking about Twitter spaces. It's essentially Clubhouse, Twitter bit Clubhouse, and then killed Clubhouse. Um, And, I mean, it's like, you know, Vine getting killed by Instagram. It's same, same, same concept. And so Oregon's football hire when Mario Cristobal left. A space has started basically on that Tuesday, and it's still going on. It's been going on basically 24-7 since then. And I thought that this may actually change how college football and sports are reported. I was like, bro, we're, this is the cutting edge of things, and we may actually need to do our show maybe on Twitter Spaces. I think the potential is is limitless. I think you you were an early adopter of Clubhouse. Um, I had trouble getting into it because there was a barrier of entry. Anytime that there's a barrier of entry to something, like I'll tell you right now, YouTube would is already like the biggest thing in the world. It would be even bigger if you could on your phone have a YouTube video playing while you're operating other apps. And I know you have the ability to pay for it, but if you just had the ability to have a YouTube video playing while you're, while you're messing around on, on, on other apps, like there'd be no reason for anybody to ever do anything other than just have YouTube videos playing all day long on their phone. Twitter spaces gives you the ability to be on Twitter, uh, interacting with other people, scrolling your newsfeed while listening in on a conversation on any subject that you might find interesting and now that it's come into play with potential coaching searches where alumni are getting involved you can see reporters who are always like hard up for a scoop jumping in oh my god bro they are where where how happy were reporters to bro that we get like we got quotes we have quotes like there's no debate that like like there's no debate about whether this was said or not because Everybody yeah. heard it, so there's no refuting it. And here's why it's good for the fans. Uh, um, besides the million reasons of, of just, like, it's interesting to them and they get access to former alumni and everything like that. Because with this Oregon Twitter spaces, as you guys were going through figuring out, you know, that you're going to hire Dan Lanning or possibly offering the job to Justin Wilcox, everything else that was going on, you had a bunch of alumni, people connect to the program. AD Rob Mullins jumped in, like, you had every reporter. Dude, the AD hopped in. The athletic yeah. director hopped in after he made the hire and talked to current and former Oregon parents, players, players, current players. Bro, it was incredible. Like, he didn't even do a press conference yet. Like, that was his first media availability was public, unfiltered. And you feel like you're part of that community because it's not recorded. It's not like you can go like, yet, yet. They're not recorded yet. You know, you have people like uh, uh, recording them for posterity for the quotes that they're going to write their articles based off of. But you had like Brandon Marcello in there and you had the entire Pacific Northwest media. Everybody's in there. And the good thing for fans is how many articles get written with anonymous program sources? You don't need yep. anonymous program sources if you can see the actual Twitter icon of the person that is speaking in that moment. And I think it's really one of the things that hurts college athletics is leaks and sources and yada, 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 when you should just be able to, like you always say, say it with your chest, right? And a lot of people involved with the Oregon football community had the ability to do that. And the other thing that I think that it did is there are people who are sensitive to how their program is portrayed by their alumni. 
because everybody is under the impression that these kids are so soft that if you say or do one wrong thing to take away from complete program unity, that it's going to hurt the program. But one thing that you can't uh, ignore is that if you have 30 people in there who all played for Oregon, who are all standing on their own two feet, saying things with their chest, giving opinions that might even conflict, you wear down anybody's ability to be offended because so many people are saying so many things that you realize these people are invested just like me. They yeah. have opinions just like me yep. and they're human on a message board. If you had all those people, you'd have, you, you probably, it would be a lot worse because everyone would be able to jump in there, uh, interact, pile on stuff like that. But in this, you're forced to listen. Yeah. And for me, I'm a, I'm an audio learner. Like, uh, to me, audio is it, it, it is a more effective for me than anything. And if I hear somebody's voice behind their words, I can't attribute a mood to them that they don't have. I'll do that on a message board all day. I'll misinterpret somebody's intent. I'll end up in a fight or on Twitter or something like that. But in this situation, you just see people who all love one thing trying to work something out together as a family. I think other programs will try to duplicate this. I think it's better in grassroots and I think yeah. it'll probably fail in some circumstances, but I do hope it becomes the new normal because this is the most Dude. entertaining and interesting. The, the, any, any college coaching search. I think been. that this was great for the Oregon brand. Dude, 2,500 people in there d days in a row. Like just having civil conversation about the program, about where it's headed, who's coming, who's who do we want, what do we, what do we need, all of this. And then last night, the athletic director was in. He didn't even come in and speak. He was in there just listening. The Oregon uh, video department, Oregon like checkmark people, have been in there listening to the space. It's super cool, dude. It is super cool. Um, do you feel? I, I just a personal question that I'm very interested in. Because for the most part, you make content, whether it's Mad Dog or Fox Sports Radio or what we do here or Pac-12 Apostles, and you serve it out there for people to digest and then talk about later. Do you feel like do you feel like there was any of this that maybe stretched you or made you a little uncomfortable or that you had to get used to in that there were so many voices or so many people that had immediate access and immediate reactions to the things that you were saying? Because you ended up at the center of this. Uh, for having your name on a letter that was sent to Rob Mullins prior to the Dan Lanning um, interview and hire saying that you guys wanted to not necessarily to keep it in the family, but consider the family. Yeah. For, and for me, and I talked about this on clubhouse. So no, it didn't stretch me far. I was actually super happy for the platform after the uh, article came out because I was like, that's not what it, its intent was. And that damn sure wasn't how I felt about it. So, cause I have been very clear. I wanted Dan Lanning as one of my top candidates. It was him, Dave Aranda, Lane Kiffin. I was there. So, which we have proof of, like, yes, we talked about Dan Lanning on this show. Like, uh, uh, oh, right. Oh after my God. Christopher and, and, and people got on, got on my, uh, Twitter. Oh, he didn't know who Dan Lanning was before two days, before a day ago. I'm like, uh, lies, lies. I do this. We've been, we've been mentioning him for every single job. Yes. We said like, Hey, is this finally the time that Dan Lanning? And then we, and when Oregon opened up, we finished that segment. And I said, what about Dan Lanning? And you said, I'd love it. Do it tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, the college football season concluded basically with the Heisman trophy ceremony and interesting Ralph, the last, I'm going to read you the last 16 Heisman winners. I'm not going to read you their names. I'm going to read you their description. Quarterback, 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 Alabama, quarterback, 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 Alabama, quarterback, 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 Alabama. Alabama quarterback. What did you learn from that list, Ralph? Uh, that it's good to either be at Alabama or play quarterback. <laughs> if you, if you're trying to get yourself a Heisman, um, and this is really the first, how, how long has it been since an, an Alabama quarterback won the Heisman before this? Do we know that? What did has that ever happened? No, I don't think it's ever happened. I'll look. I'll look. You tell me what. Because did you get a chance to watch the ceremony? Yes, I well, I watched about half of it. 
what you and you had a couple of specific issues with who with was invited, who was there. Right? Yeah, I, I, obviously, I, leak, I think Aiden Hutchinson is a great player. I think Kenny Pickett's a great player. Do you, I mean, it, it quick, was really a landslide being, victory. It, it was really a landslide victory. Do you think being victory. there? Do you think being there is its own form of the award? So, for for a defensive player, absolutely, and for a running back, absolutely. But I don't. I just don't understand how Kenneth Walker, running back from Michigan State, and Will Anderson who stats, who plays the same position as Aiden Hutchinson, just as dominant and but had better stats, didn't end up at the ceremony. But that's not hating on Aiden Hutchinson. Maybe it should have been a closer vote with five people there. But but Will, but uh Bryce Young probably vultured um Will Anderson's votes. Now, I mean did you do you feel like do you feel like they got it right? Yeah, oh, oh overall, yeah. I mean, I would have liked it to be have been a defensive player. I would have given it to either Will Anderson or H- Hutchinson. I would have felt better about that. But but I don't How, hate it. I, I actually like that it was Bryce Young instead of CJ Stroud because not that Stroud didn't have a good year. But I just thought that it was, you know, like that his wide receivers did so much damn work, dude. Them suckers, uh, Smith and Jigba, uh, Olave, uh, what's his name, Garrett Williams. Bro, that's a hell of a receiving core. And it felt like, it would have felt like Mac Jones winning the Heisman Trophy instead of Devontae Smith. Did it come down, do you feel like, to the SEC championship? If Alabama had lost that game, who do you think would have won the Heisman? Him, because uh, because Ohio State wasn't in the championship. If Ohio State had been in the Big Ten championship and won it to go to the playoff and Alabama lost, then you would have had C.J. Stroud, Heisman winner. Do you feel like what, I guess Desmond Howard made a joke? Um, about Ohio State from the stage and took a lot of uh, criticism for it? Do you think people are being oversensitive? Yes. Yes, dude. It's a rivalry. Get toughen up, buttercup. I, I totally agree with that. All right. Um, so you are, but you are correct. I do not see a single yeah. Alabama quarterback in the history of, of the Heisman. This is, the, this is amazing. This is the first Alabama quarterback to ever win the Heisman. Yep, because they, they, they're just now getting quarter, quarterbacks since, like, what was that, Stabler? <laughs> back, back in the day. <laughs> Ralph. Right. All right. Now time for the fun, buddy. You had. I know this Instagram post touched you. Kim Kardashian announced <laughs> that she had passed her bar exam, Ralph. I'm sorry, that she passed the baby bar, which is apparently... What is a baby bar? It is where you, instead of taking the one bar exam, you actually have to take two smaller ones. But supposedly, according to Kim, it's more difficult to do it that way. Obviously, she's been studying her ass off. She failed the first three times. The last time she took it, she had COVID, she said, all of those things. But she passed it. And I think that this is a notable achievement because she's got all the money in the world, all the success in the world, and she's actually trying to do something in addition to that with her life. And I I love it, dude. I I think that she's ambitious, a good role model for, for people, that it's not just about the fame and the money, that it's actually like, let me do something with with myself absolutely love it um yeah i thought it was fan fan freaking tastic but now the question is ralph will you hire her to be your lawyer after she passes the certainly second could <laughs> i don't know assuming assuming that money is still of any value to her as a human being i'm pretty sure that i could not afford kim kardashian her, her hourly attorney. rate gonna be um, like through the, it's either gonna be pro bono at 20 thou wow homie I need I need a I need a <laughs> Maybe, million dollar retainer, homie, because <laughs> your case is gonna get this publicity. I did have to uh, argue in court once against a lawyer. I didn't know that the other side was gonna show up at all, and when they showed up and brought a lawyer, and I had to defend 
my side by myself, it was the most scared I've ever been yep. in my life. And but I, I'll I will say this. I don't really care about um Kim Kardashian and not in the way that people say like, oh, I don't care about Kim Kardashian, because they say it with like that aggressive stank on it. Yeah. Like they hate the idea that people exist that are famous for being famous. That's just the, the the truth of the matter. Like I don't I don't consider Kim Kardashian in my daily life. I acknowledge her existence and I acknowledge her importance in the in the business world and celebrity gossip world and 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 hip hop and NBA <laughs> and all of those things. Like I, I get that. However, I do think that it's cool that there are people out there, rightfully or wrongfully, that have the ability to be societal trendsetters that would use their position to better themselves and not just physically but like educationally yeah um that would that would actually like put in the work to do something like that there's absolutely no shame whatsoever in failing the bar exam like getting to the position where you have the attempt to take the bar exam is crazy and then eventually passing it is is awesome and i think that if she makes education and issues of justice reform cool then she will deserve a lot of positive attention because yep. I, to me that's a num- that's like a number one or two issue dude uh, and of, fa- of importance for me is is that our our prison system was got linked into a capitalistic um endeavor and it became profitable to house yep criminals and not and and not reform them and if she brings awareness yep. to that and and also this platform to that throw people up, in jail and also to throw people in jail too because you because they because the, they have contracts that say that they have to be a certain percentage full like exactly bro um, anybody who helps reform that is is somebody that I, will, I absolutely will hold in very high esteem yeah and the fact that her dad was a lawyer and the fact that it matters to her what her dad thinks and what he, he's long passed away but that this is dude this is absolutely huge well you guys, this is Reister or Wrong. I'm George Reister. He's Ralph Amsden. Peace out. Catch you guys on Wednesday. Share the pod. Peace.